So, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so, I'm Valandino and I'll talk about uh, a few studies uh, that uh, my research is not really focused entirely on accessibility, uh, but always been in and out and somehow on the bridge between accessibility and what uh, I, I was working on with musicians and some other areas. So apologies if I'm missing out on something. Uh, so this first case study is from, uh, um, during my time at Goldsmiths down in London, um, uh, one of the projects that I was working on is, um, basically we had this idea of making, uh, of enhancing digital signage for visually impaired people using sound and haptic feedback. Okay, so the idea was to use uh, mid-air haptic feedback to make something that was displayed on a scenage uh, that, uh, that someone could touch or feel, okay, so, like a virtual object there uh, floating in air. And you will get the, uh, the respective auditory feedback of when you would interact with this object. So we use the Ulcalib Stratos that was just mentioned before, that basically, if you are not aware of what it is, is basically a bidimensional array of ultrasound speakers that basically they move the air underneath the end where you place it, and there is a lip motion, and when you move your end on top of this device, the lip motion tracks where your end is, and the whole energy from the speakers is focused on your end. So you kind of feel this air buzzing under your, under your end, that hits your end, so you have a, the perception of touching something that is there. Uh, that's the idea. It's not 100% efficient, but they do a fairly good job. So the idea was that, as you can see, in Unity, uh, we built, together with Tikonas, uh, Mechadez, with her supervisor as well. <laughs> so um, when I was at BCU, I met him. Uh, and uh, we had this sphere that the idea was to, to let the user to touch a, a virtual piece of paper. And why a piece of paper, you might ask? Because uh, a few years before, uh, during my PhD, I was working on using uh, EMG wearable devices to to interact with sound objects in mid -air. So you would wear uh, this armband and you would try to, to manipulate sound like if it would be an object in mid -air. And one of the case studies that, uh, that, that I went through is how to manipulate a crumbling piece of paper that is there in mid -air, but is not there. So just you explore the auditory feedback just through the interaction with this virtual piece of paper. Anyway, I'll just play the video and uh, I guess it will be way much more clear. And this was the idea that, that we did with the haptic feedback. So we basically tried to add haptic feedback to meet their interactions with uh, some virtual objects. Although I have to add that when you, um, there is also a kind of a, a level of internal feedback of when you engage your muscles, say you try to grab something. If you do something like this now, with you, you kind of, there is some internal feedback in between your muscles that gives you um, some idea of what you're holding and so on. So uh, from here, uh, we moved towards uh, uh, thinking about also what are all the uh, human-centered uh, aspects, what are all the um, senses and what is it all that is involved in the appreciation of musical works, interfaces, instruments, 
but we wanted to do it in a collaborative, interactive, inclusive, and in diverse music environment. So, uh, in embodied music interaction, uh, one of the principles that is really looked uh, at is the concept of affordances of uh, musical sound. So, what are the uh, actions or gestures that a musical sound invites? Okay. But uh, previous studies, what we, we noticed is that when uh, previous research, when they did their studies, they looked at people with uh, not a particular disability. So if in the perceiving the, the affordances of a sound, our perception of that sound changes, then also the affordances change, which is not the same one. So we were, we were looking at, uh, at this from uh, this point of view. We tried to coin this term uh, um, with uh, human sound interaction as direct engaging natural and body interaction with sound, where direct is as the impression of feeling about an interface capable of being described in terms of concrete actions engaging as fostering the feeling of directly manipulating the objects of interest where the world of interest is explicitly represented and there is no intermediary between the user and the world. Natural has been marked by spontaneity and embodied as the extension and incorporation of human skills and abilities within the interaction design of a system. So on this principle, uh, what we did, uh, we tried to enhance our previous work uh, to bring it further. We wanted to have a more uh, tangible or three-dimensional, uh, more physical visual feedback. And uh, we worked on uh, using holographic projections, but because of doing a, a true holographic projection is very expensive, uh, what we did is using the paper ghost illusions that instead is incredibly cheap. Uh, so uh, what we did here, we used again the ultra lip stratus, okay? Uh, and then here is our holographic projection that uh, seen in this way, it doesn't look like, but basically here on top of here, there is a screen. Here there is a, a transparent plexiglass, uh, where so the image is reflected there, and when there is a very dark background, you perceive kind of if the image is floating there in there. So our idea is uh, to provide now also visual feedback, uh, so that the person could interact with this image, feel it, and uh, hearing about the actions with this with this object. And uh, this is how. Uh, yes. things. Um, we call this sound sculpt because uh, when we started working on it, it felt like that you are molding something, like you mold clay. And then, so the idea was that um, by touching this uh, line, you would uh, enhance or decrease the um, interact with the filter, basically, on a sound signal, okay? And uh, so, and the buzzing that you hear, which I left it there by purpose, um, is not a case. That if while you use the actual device, you don't hear it, but then we captured it with the cameras, we didn't know. And basically, this, the sound that you hear is basically the air eating the hand when you use it. And who has used the Ultra Stratos? You don't really hear it. But with a camera, you can actually capture the <coughs> air eating the hands. And uh, if you notice, whenever you, the user was going towards the shape, you would hear the buzzing. So that's the, the air there. So um, 
The next project is a project that I just concluded uh, a few weeks ago, I wrote the report, um, which is uh, called BSL in uh, EMI, where uh, we looked at uh, how British Sign Language interpreters, they interpret music to a deaf audience. Uh, and now when I say interpret, I don't really, I don't um, refer to the lyrics only, but to, to the musical content, to the instrumental parts. So we worked with a company called Performing Interpreting that is uh, specialized in providing services for uh, large concerts. Um, and uh, we interviewed and asked several interpreters to uh, interpret two pieces of music and then we did an analysis of their movements um, also using computer vision and we tried to find some patterns in between if there were commonalities across uh, interpreters. Uh, some of the data they look like this, uh, some of them. Uh, so we had key uh, heat maps of what they moved and how uh, joints of the skeleton uh, that we cracked, the, uh, one of the features like the quantity of motions, which means how much they moved on a frame by frame basis during the video, uh, me, and by how much I mean the displacement of every part of the body over time. And, uh, and then we compared about perceptual quality of sound, like loudness and spectral features like back coefficients and so on. Some of uh, the uh, captured video, they looked like this. I stop it there because it's quite long, uh, but there, is, there are videos and there is a repository with all the data sets, if you want, on GitHub, if you want to give me your details, I'll send you the whole data set. Uh, so as you can see, there are some commonalities uh, between participants, the way they, read, or they try to interpret the rhythm of the percussions, and there are many other features. So, to wrap everything up across all these projects, I didn't talk about analysis, participants, experiments, and numbers, and so on, but to wrap up in a very few points, oops, uh, something that we gathered, or a kind of a trend across all these three projects, is that sound and music should be multimodal to others because we all rely on different senses. We focused mostly on uh, vision and hearing, uh, not physical um, uh, impairments, uh, but the, so that people can just rely on the sense they are most comfortable with. And this is one of the things that, uh, it must seem obvious, but one of the thoughts overall is that if we provide as many, as much feedback, always that suits the, the person, then someone can just filter out what they are most comfortable with and that makes sense more of it. And then one size fits all solutions, they do not work, we did attempt one, but it's ju it just doesn't. Uh, but perhaps what we, ca we could do is provide a palette of interaction modalities and feedback modalities and then, then uh, an individual can just choose uh, around it or customize it, uh, customize them. It's like, for example, in the case of Chris creating those, how is it called, the, the pad that he uses? The, the, the square pad? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a device, it's a standard, it's built, but at the same time it's customizable. You can do, a, you can inter, you can, I bet you can resize these sliders mm -hmm. and all those things. So 
that's what we really should move forward and it's already been doing and then with the bsl and also other projects i really by talking to interpreters and the deaf communities uh, i really understood that communicating a musical message is not a standard at all music is not a standard it's so subjective it evolves over time it depends on who we are where we come from our culture background and everything so for us that we were trying to model how interpreters try to communicate how to communicate something that is not a standard is even possible uh, but and also do we need a standard do we want even want one for something that is so free and that and it just led to people's imagination why do we want to really model it and so on. Uh, I don't have answers to that, I just thoughts, to be honest. So if you want to answer to some of them, uh, fair enough. Um, I'm really uh, glad to hear it from you, but uh, that's uh, from me. Yeah. Thank you.